Hello and welcome from the Institute of Korean Studies at Fryan University, Berlin, for today's lecture on changes in North Korean comedy from theaters to the digital world. It will be presented by Professor Dr. Emmanuel Kim. My name is Dr. Kang Ho Jae. I am a, a research professor at the Institute of Korean Studies. My major in research topic and teaching topic is North Korea, especially history of science technology policy in North Korea. Today's lecture is the third in a series of special lecture on North Korea. In the winter semester of 2021-22, organized and hosted within the framework of the Korean Europe Center, a joint project by our institute and the KDI School of Public Policy and Management in Sejong City. As a title, looking at North Korean from different angles, already su suggests that the lecture in this series reflect and hope to further contribute to an approach toward the study of North Korean that try to move away from the often excessive or at times even exclusive focus on question of power struggle and ideology in present day politics and international relations. A focus that has so far from characteristic of much of the research on North Korea. In other words, this series of lecture is intended to allow the uh, presenter and the audience to explore a whole variety of subject matters as they relate to North Korea, and to do so in a manner that is sensitive to the long term historical perspectives. Now, I want to uh, introduce today's lecture. He is an uh, associate professor of Korean literature and culture studies at the George Washington University. He is a specialist in North Korean literature and cinema. Uh, his research focuses on the change and development, particularly in the representation of women, sexuality, and the memory of the Korean literature from 1916s to present day. His book, the Writing Revolution, uh, Women, Sexuality, and Memory in North Korean Fiction, published in 2018. It explored the complex and the dynamic literary culture that has deeply impacted the society. His second book, called Lapping North Korean, Culture of the Film Industry, published in 2020. It is on North Korean comedy films and the way in which Humor has been an integral component of the everyday life. By exploring comic film and comedians, he looks past the sensible propaganda and examines the agency of rapper. Professor Kim has also translated North Korean famous novels called Friends in Korean, written by Bang Nam Yong. Now, I want to invite Professor Kim to the stage with a closure. Very much, Professor Kang, uh, for that lovely introduction. Uh, guten Tag, everyone. Uh, it's uh, wonderful to be here in Berlin. About 20, 22, 23 years ago, I visited Berlin and I remember uh, getting off the train station and noticing that all the taxis were Mercedes Benz. And I was thinking, what what kind of a society am I walking into right now where even the taxis are Mercedes Benz? And I remember my hostel was in Ospenhof. So that was the uh, train station that I'm very familiar with. And I hope one day I will be able to revisit Berlin uh, as it is one of my favorite European cities. Let me share my screen with you. Yes, my second book is called Laughing North Koreans. And today's talk will look at the changes in North Korean comedy representations. But first, with the joke, uh, there was a British man, French man, and a North Korean man who were at a museum, and they saw this painting of Adam and Eve. The British man says, ah, Adam and Eve are British because they love to share an apple. The French man says, no, no, no. Adam and Eve are French because they like to walk around in the nude. And then the North Korean man says, no, no, no. Adam and Eve are North Koreans because they have nothing to eat and they think they live in paradise. So this is a joke by the Chinese. The way the Chinese make fun of North Korea is rather interesting because you would think that North Korea and China has a very good relationship, and they do, but the Chinese also know how to make fun of North Koreans. 
Well, we're very familiar with how the rest of the world makes fun of North Korea. We know that this man is usually the target of many jokes, especially in Hollywood films. So there are uh, caricatures of Kim Jong-il. And of course, the new leader, Kim Jong-un, is also played by a, a comedian in Hollywood. And this is a film called The Interview, which caused a lot of problems between the U.S. and North Korea. So again, jokes about North Korea is prevalent. It's everywhere. But my argument is that North Koreans themselves are agents of their own laughter, meaning they know comedy. They produce comedy, not for anyone else, but for their own people. They are producing comedy to make their own people laugh. And if you look at a lot of North Korean films, we can say predominantly they are dramatic films, but there is a good percentage of comedy films as well. That's because North Korea has a very long history of comedy, dating back all the way to the 1940s. And comedy has impacted the people, the film industry, and society. And by that, what I mean is the actors, the film industry itself, has produced all these years, all kinds of comedians who have impacted the way North Koreans view themselves. And they've become like a household name, meaning when you see them on the screen, everyone knows who they are. And in many cases, they go to watch certain films because their favorite actor or comedian is in that film. So in that sense, very much like the West, the film industry and the film culture in North Korea is very similar to us based on laughter. But before we get into the comedy, I'm sure you guys are very familiar with the masterpieces of North Korean film. We got the Five Gorilla Brothers. We got the Sea of Blood, of course. And we got the Flower Girl. These are always talked about in North Korean film by, uh, by the North Korean film critics. Uh, you'll still see many cultural references when you go to North Korea. You'll see posters or propaganda slogans from Sea of Blood or Flower Girl. And there are also box office hits, ones that the people have really enjoyed over the years. For example, The Nation and Destiny, one of the longest running series in North Korea. And many of these can be found on YouTube. My favorite series is Nameless Heroes. It's a spy film based in, the, uh, well, in South Korea uh, during the Korean War. This is a 20-part series, became really, really popular in North Korea. In fact, there are some testimonies by defectors who say when, whenever they were going to show uh, the next episode of this film series, people from all over the village would crowd into that room. Some, some cases, they would break the window to try to walk in and, and crawl into the, uh, the, the space there. So it was really popular. If you're familiar with the Russian film, 17 Moments of Spring, there's a lot of speculation that Nameless Heroes borrowed uh, many techniques and the storyline from 17 Moments of Spring. These films, Five Gorilla Brothers, Sea of Blood, and The Flower Girl, along with uh, Min Jo Kwa Myung and Nameless Heroes, there's one star that if you want to know anything about North Korean film culture, you have to know this person. And his name is Kim Yong Min. It's a slightly difficult name to say. It's, it's a very unusual name, Kim Yong Min. But this man, I would say, is the face of North Korean film culture. He's pretty much in any box office hit film in North Korea. He usually plays the protagonist, hardly the villain. And he's so popular that when he passed away, I believe in 2012 or 2013, I can't remember. Kim Jong-un, according to uh, testimonies in Lo Dong Shimun, he wept for three days and uh, the, the whole nation was under some kind of national crisis that their superstar has passed away. So that's the kind of impact this movie star had in the whole society. There are two other, I would say, popular, very popular movie stars, Kim Cha and, of course, Lee Yong-ho. Uh, Lee Yong-ho became really famous after uh, a 1980s film called Hong Gil Tong. And after that, he became almost the uh, sex symbol of North Korea, where women would scream out his name whenever they're filming. They would crowd around just to get a glimpse of his face. So these two men are considered the pretty boys, the George Clooney, Brad Pitt, or whoever you find to be attractive, right? Of course, there are female stars as well. Han ge she also came out in Hong Gil Tong. This is a, a, a clip from Hong Gil Tong. The woman on the uh, right is a very famous Kim Yong-soo, uh, another comedian, Kim Mo-ki. My favorite comedian, Han Mi-sun. 
Jung Mizuk is another one who, all of these comedians, they go back and forth from uh, dramatic films and comedy films. So there's no real like set comedian. They do both dramatic <laughs> roles and uh, comedy. <clears throat> this is also Kim Young Zook. So many women share that name. Kim Jong Ha from uh, Nameless Heroes. She doesn't do comedy as much. She mostly does dramatic films. This is Kim Jong Il's favorite actress, Oh Mi Ran. Uh, Lee Kyung Hee. Uh, she came out in two romantic comedy films. This one is called On the Green Carpet, I believe. The one romantic comedy film that she became really famous for was Urban Girl or Urban Woman Comes to Marry. Do Si Chon Si Ji Boya, right? So uh, that's where she became really famous. And today, the superstar of romantic comedy is uh, Kim Moon Young. In fact, she came out in another film called Comrade Kim Goes Flying. So a few categories and themes that we find in North Korean comedy history. Of course, it begins with theater. And I will talk about that in a second. As I mentioned, there are plenty of romantic comedies. Now, is the romantic comedy similar to South Korean romantic comedy? For example, like Crash Landing on You. Uh, is it similar to Hollywood uh, romantic comedies? No, they are slightly different. In fact, they're very different. Uh, you're not going to find kissing scenes. You're not going to find, certainly you're not going to find any sex scenes uh, in any of these co romantic comedy films. They're still uh, at the level of maybe, maybe holding hands. But even holding hands is a little too much. If they're dating and they love each other, they'll just stand next to each other and walk along a Potong River or the Daedong River. And that scene itself is very romantic. Now you might think, well, that's, that's silly. How could that be romantic? Uh, you know, you have to have a kissing scene or at least a holding hands scene. Well, we have to remember in South Korea as well, it took many decades before there were kissing scenes, right? Um, that we're so used to in, in dramas today. I remember back in the eighties and nineties, kissing scene is really hard to find, right? So, um, we got to put it in perspective here. There's a lot of satire in North Korean comedy films. Uh, in fact, that's probably the dominant mode and theme across uh, all these comedy films. And I'll show you some uh, clips later on. My favorite kind of comedy film is the mistaken identities. They think it's one person, but it's another person and so forth. And there's confusion and so forth. Uh, family Ties, I'll get into some family uh, related comedy films and I'll end the talk today with television short dramas. Okay, so theater. I don't know if you're familiar in Europe and uh, the United States, the history of comedy it really derives from the vaudevilles. These are traveling shows. They don't always travel, but many times they do. Uh, and there are many performances. It's not just a comedy show. It's a whole circus. Singing, dancing, juggling, magic tricks, clowns, acrobats. And there are many familiar Hollywood stars who started with vaudeville. Marx Brothers, and of course, the most famous Charlie Chaplin started in vaudeville. So we see these people who acted on stage and when cinema became the new trend, they shifted over to cinema. And of course it was silent at the time, but when, when films shifted over to sound, that's when it also changed and transformed the cinema culture altogether. Well, North Korea also has a theater performance. It's called Hwasul Sopun. And here it can be a traveling team. They go from village to village gather the villagers around and perform. In this case, it's at a studio or it's at a theater. Uh, you can see the microphone set up like that. If it's not called Hwasul Sopum, there's another called Jedam. Very similar in terms of style, basically on stage. And it, there are short skits, anywhere from seven to 15 minutes long. What both of these performances have in common is they like to play on words. So North Koreans, they're very clever in terms of how to use language, how to manipulate language, and they find humor in that. You will not see uh, what we would consider physical comedy. In other words, slapping each other, throwing pies at each other, you know, slipping and falling and people laughing at that. People, uh, you know, any kind of humor that requires physical or kind of violence, you're not going to find that in North Korea as much. Instead, it's very theatrical and it's play on words. One of the early romantic comedy films in the 1960s was called Jolly State, Yongnan Mude. And here it's about the circus. If this is the circus itself and they're performing on stage, they sing, dance, do all kinds of acrobatic, then there's a film about that right in North Korea. And by the way, this was a very popular film. And then I will play the drums. 
this was made in the 70s, again, wildly popular because some of the household comedian names and faces all came out in this film. So both this film, which had many comedians, and this one were box office hits when it came to comedy films. And A Day at the Amusement Park, you can find all this on YouTube, by the way. I'm not sure if they're subtitled, but this was another real famous popular comedy film because this one had two things. North Korea was bragging about their amusement park. They wanted to show their people how wonderful the party is and how wonderful the amusement park is. So that's the first, I guess you can call it the propaganda part. But then the story itself is hilarious. It's all mistaken identities. They get confused with each other and they're running around the entire amusement park. A more recent one, and by recent, this was, I believe, 1996. This is called Oh Youth. And these two uh, people are dating. They're on a roller coaster. The man on the right is a historian or he's a student of history. He's receiving his master's degree in history. The woman on the right is actually a black belt in Taekwondo, but she's acting like she's on. Well, it's, again, mistaken identity. So uh, their, their identities are not completely revealed yet. It's relatively hilarious. I consider comedy films in the 70s to be a little funnier than uh, the ones made later. Our Flavor, Uri Hyungi, is another romantic comedy uh, that became wildly popular. This is because the whole film is about kimchi. And of course, for those who have not seen Comrade Kim Goes, Goes Flying, please watch it. It's a very unique film. It's not entirely North Korean. It's also made by a, a British director and a Belgian director. This is a collaboration with North Koreans, filmed in North Korea with North Korean actors, comedians. And all these famous, hilarious comedians all star in this film as well. So I, I really appreciated that. But if you're going to talk about the single most important comedian in North Korean culture would be by the, uh, this comedian by the name of Kim Se-yong. He's in pretty much every comedy film until he passed away in the mid-90s. And again, when he passed away, uh, Kim Il-sung himself paid tribute and visit uh, to the funeral. That's how much of an impact Kim se young had. He originally began his career in South Korea before he went up to the North. I mean, he is hands down probably the most important face. If Kim yong nin is an important face of dramatic films, Kim se young is probably the most important face in comedy. And the way I... I see him is, again, he's not a very physical comedian. He's more like a Tracy Spencer uh, in Hollywood. His, his demeanor, his personality is very much like Tracy Spencer. His stardom, uh, his rise to fame, really, is my family's problem, Uri Jin Munje. This is perhaps my favorite comedy series of all time. That My family's problem is my translation of Uri Jin Munje. Uh, for those who know a little bit of uh, Korean, uh, Uri means our, but in Korean culture, you can also say my, right? Uh, Uri also refers to my. Jip is house. Literally, it's a house. And Munje is problem. So the North Koreans translated this series as the problem with my house. I didn't like that translation. The problem with our house, because it sounds like there's some plumbing issues. I didn't like that. So I translated it again and I called it my family's problem because it's there's an issue in the film that they're trying to overcome. I added subtitles and put it up on YouTube, so I'm sure you can find it. When I saw this film, I thought, wow, this is an amazing film. Again, it's not the kind of comedy that we're used to watching in Hollywood or South Korea. It has a little different flavor. The problem here in this case is the wife. The wife is someone who loves expensive items, mink coats, beautiful furniture. Uh, the whole film is about her trying to keep up with the Joneses. She wants to be better than her neighbors. And then, of course, because of her problem and her greed and all that, there's a downfall. Uh, it's propaganda, of course. I mean, we can't really get away from propaganda. But the important thing is how the comedy is done. Right? And these two people became household names after this film. People, I mean, when you talk to defectors, especially those who lived through the 70s and 80s, if you ask them, do you know my family's problem? Do you know Uri Jin Munje? I would be very shocked if those defectors say, no, I've never heard of it. I would be very shocked because this film had such a huge social impact. In fact, there's only one person in all of North Korea who did not like this film. And that was Kim Jong-il himself. This is what he had to say about the film. The film I saw today called My Family's Problem 
not only has an obvious ending, but it lacks a strong narrative. It does not follow the party's purpose and is made into a comedy. As a result, it is not worth watching and it contains very little educational value. This is Kim Jong-un. Now let's break this down. So he saw this film called My Family's Problem, but according to Kim Jong-un, he thinks it has an obvious, obvious ending. Uh, what is this obvious ending? The obvious ending is that the protagonist in the film has a downfall and he didn't like that. He wanted the protagonist to learn his mistakes or her mistakes and then get back up. And then he says that this film wasn't made according to the party's purpose and it was made into a comedy. Uh, what he means by this is the film was made simply to make people laugh. And I'm thinking, yes, it's a comedy film. Of course you want people to laugh. If people are not laughing, it's not a comedy film. But according to Kim, jo Kim Jong-il, he wanted the film to be educational. That's his definition of good comedy. You have to learn something from it. So he told the filmmakers, this is not a good film. Don't show it. Don't screen it anymore. But because it was so widely popular, Kim Jong-il had a different idea. He said, okay, I want you to make a sequel, part two. But this time, I want you to make it very educational. I want them to learn something from this. So it took the filmmakers, the very same filmmakers, the same director, the same screenwriter, the same production crew. It took them six years to come up with part two. But once they came up with part two, they realized, hey, we can have a lot of fun with this. Let's make a part three, part four, part five. In fact, it turned out to be a 12 part series and it's called the My, My Family's Problem series. And here is the whole list of the film series. First one, My Family's Problem. Second one, Our Next Door Neighbor's Problem. Our Upstairs Neighbor's Problem. Our Downstairs Neighbor's Problem. Our Wife's Family's Problem. Our Older Brother's Family's Problem. Our Sister's Family's Problem. Our In-Law's Family's Problem. Our Younger Brother's Family's Problem. And guess what? We are all one family in North Korea. And when you thought that this film series solved every single problem in North Korea, our family's problem begins again. The filmmakers had a lot of fun making this series. And when you look at the entire series, it does draw a little bit of laughter. Because to me, uh, the filmmakers themselves, they followed exactly what Kim Jong-il wanted. But they went a little bit further than that. They went a little bit more than that. Why? Because they have a great sense of humor. North Koreans have a great sense of humor. One of the most striking films to me was Our Meaningful Life made in 1980. Here on the right, you see the famous comedian Kim se young who's standing next to the famous dramatic actor Kim yong min And here you see uh, Hyun Mi-sun, who's standing next to a woman by the name of Han Gil-myung. Okay. What is going on in this film? Kim se young who is dressed up like a grandfather here, and Hyun mi -sun, who is dressed up as a grandmother here, they are both visiting the North Korean film uh, studio. And as they are taking the bus to go inside the film studio, they run into the actors in North Korea. And the actors are not playing a part. They are playing themselves. So Kim yong min is playing Kim yong min And... The grandfather here says, hey, I recognize you. I think I know who you are. Aren't you that famous Kim Jong Min?" And everyone laughs. Of course, it's the famous. Everyone in the bus, they all laugh because, of course, this is the famous Kim Jong Min." And Hyun mi over here, the grandmother, runs into the famous actress Han gil Myung and says, hey, wait a minute. I know who you are. Aren't you the wife from my family's problem? That's right. I remember you. And they're making this reference to themselves. And... I never knew that North Korea, there was a film like this in North Korea where the actors are referencing themselves. And to me, this was absolutely fascinating because it confirms what the audience members already know. And that is there are so many famous North Korean film stars, comedians who've impacted the society that there is a film about celebrating their actors. And I will end uh, with the television shorts. Late in the 1970s, Kim Jong-il wanted satirical films about North Koreans. Now, this is very interesting. Before, satire films were about the imperialist Americans or the Japanese, and occasionally the South Koreans. So the enemy was always very clear. It's the Americans or the Japanese. But as time went on, that shifted. And the new enemy or the so-called enemy is not found outside of the country. It's found within the country. It's the North Koreans who are not living up to the socialist standards. So Kim Jong-un commissioned filmmakers to come up with films that target these North Koreans who are not living according to the party standards. 
And he gave it a name. And these short films were called We Must Get Rid of This Problem series. And there were a handful, maybe a dozen of these films made in the late 70s, carried on to the 80s, 90s, and even present day. Uh, in the 70s, it was called We Must Get Rid of This Problem. But in the 80s, they didn't use that uh, series uh, title. They changed it to something else. In the 90s, they also changed it. But recently, I've been watching a lot of YouTube uh, sh uh, television shorts, and they revived. They came back with this We Must Get Rid of This Problem series. There's new technology involved. There's far better uh, editing. I was so shocked to watch a lot of these new films. And I realized, oh, it's better editing because they're using digital cameras now. The plot development is much better and the character development, so much better. And in fact, many of these actually look like South Korean dramas. So let me introduce you to uh, a few of these. So I'm not gonna show the entire clip. I want you to watch uh, perhaps the first couple minutes. And you know that this series is called We Must Get Rid of This Problem because of its intro. Uh, and unfortunately, it's not subtitled. I'm working on it. But yes, you can just watch the way it's filmed and the way it's uh, presented. Salimunga, <laughs> Right, so the storyline of this uh, short film is about uh, providing good laptops newer technology to uh, schools so that our younger generation can learn and be up to date with the rest of the world. So uh, everyone has laptops. I'll, I'll skip ahead and you'll see the schools giving out laptops. You see the domestic space. You see a lot of consumerism in uh, these films. Here they are, the students taking exams with laptops. So I thought this was a very interesting short that North Koreans are showing these days, uh, something that is with the times. And we know that Kim Jong-un is all about new technology, modernization. Um, and so I thought this film was very reflective of Kim Jong-un's idea. The second one, Again, it's the same series. Hello. Hello. いや、そう。え、ちょっと待って、待って、待って。え、ちょっと待って、待って。え、ちょっと待って、待って。え、ちょっと待って、待って。え、ちょっと待って、待って。え、ちょっと待って、待って。え、ちょっと待って、待って。
So I thought that was an interesting topic as well. Something that is relevant to our society today as a whole. Uh, there's another short film that I'm not going to show uh, in this lecture, but it's also about um, the problem with addicted or addiction to your phone. Right. So there is a character who is addicted to playing games on his mobile phone. And the idea of that short film is this is a social problem, as it is a problem for not only North Koreans, but for the for all of us, really. Right. We are completely addicted to our phones. So, again, a lot of these short films are satirical. They're making fun of certain uh, certain actors or certain characters in the short film because they are not living according to party standards. But these party standards are not limited to only North Korea. These are global issues. So although we think that a lot of North Korean films are restricted to only North Koreans, we see the themes to be much larger, advancing in technology, educating our, our, our younger generation with better technology, recycling, climate change, and being addicted to our technology our phones. These are all relevant issues that also affect North Koreans, and it's reflected in their short films that are presented today. These changes uh, that are going to come up in North Korea, I, I think it's going to be soon, soon, much sooner than later. And already the two clips that I showed you at the end, a, a really huge, I mean, Hyang Jin, wouldn't you agree? This is a, a dramatic change, right? Mm -hmm. From what we're used to seeing in North Korea, huge change, oh. right? Okay. Um, the way it's edited, the way it's performed, the way the lighting, the, the sound quality, you know, as North Korea is shifting over to the di digital world, they're understanding this new technology, right? And all I can see and all I can expect from North Korea is change, right? That's all I can expect from this point on. That's, that's why you choose your title, uh, digital, your technology. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because that's where North Korea is heading. What I find is North Korea is experimenting with these short films, right? They're testing it out, seeing if it works. And if the audience response is good and, you know, it's really cost effective, then they'll switch over, right? Um, but they're taking baby steps right now. And I think baby steps are good. Uh, thank you very much. Professor Kim, with a pleasure, uh, we will ending of this event. We will see each other in next event. I will invite you, or I be, I will be invited to you. <laughs> yeah, have a nice day. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much.